look at this just a little bit tonight. Look at Luke chapter 22, and I want you to read in verse 1, and I want your heart to be uh, ready to see what God has for you, because I think there's some things that are very important that we need to deal with uh, tonight in this idea of this betrayal. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 22, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And I understand those terms are used a little bit simultaneously. They're kind of used together, but um, th there's a little bit of a different meaning. But we'll look at the Passover here in just a moment tonight. The Bible says this, And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might what? Kill him. Now, they've been wanting to do this for a while, but they are seeking for a way. The idea of kill, kill here, from what I understand, it's more than just we just want to kill him. It's they want to bring him down, and they want to get rid of this guy. They want torture. They want this to be bad. They are very upset with Jesus, and we'll explain why here in just a minute. But it says they don't do it because they feared the people. These were, by the way, religious men. These were supposedly the godly men. These were the ones people looked up to. But what was their problem? At the end of the day, they feared the people. Notice verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. Remember, there's another Judas. So the, 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 the authors are very careful to say when it's this Judas, okay? When they're writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might what? Betray him. This is a very familiar story, but let's not miss some principles. Betray him unto them. And they were what? Glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Right away, red flags should be going up because they want to do it at the cover of night when it's out away from everybody so the crowds will not see. You must understand, during this week, what some would call a passion week, when uh, what I'm told is possible to be around 2 million Jews come to Jerusalem. Now, with that being said, there would be a higher group of Roman soldiers that would be there to put down any riots that would come. The men love their power and their prestige more than they love the Word of God and the promises of the Word of God. I want you to think of just a couple of thoughts, just an introduction this morning in this idea of the betrayal of Judas. We've just concluded in chapter 21, we've just seen uh, uh, pointing us toward the end times. We've just seen that. We've seen, look back at chapter 21 down in verse uh, 25. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, this distress of nations with perplexity, that's the idea of at a loss, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. These are not things that describe any events that happened when Jerusalem was taken over in A.D. 70. These are all events that will happen after Revelation in chapter 5, these are all future events that are coming. Jesus has told us from the time he leaves, our problems are going to get worse and worse and bigger and bigger until they climax in the book of Revelation. After we have ascended into heaven, things are going to happen here like we've never seen before on the earth. It's going to be great hardship, great trouble, great trying. That's why I praise the Lord that we are, we're a gospel-minded church because we know it's only Jesus that can truly change an individual. It's only Jesus who can save people from that time. And all of us need to be focused on that. Yesterday, man, we had such a great time going soul winning. We meet here on Saturdays at 11 o'clock. And to be honest, I mean, no one's an expert. No one has all the answers. We went out. We had the opportunity. We met a neighbor down the road here. We just knocked on some doors and we invited him to church. We met a man named Ed. Head goes to, I think, the Church of God, and he told me he knew Jesus as his Savior, and we got a chance to pray with him for his wife. His wife was going through some health issues. We're not out there trying to force everyone to come to our church. We're out there to be a blessing and to point people to Jesus Christ. We got a chance to pray with them a little later. I talked to a man uh, by the name of Sherry uh, down the road here, and uh, he, he, he invited uh, Lucas. Lucas was with me, and uh, he had a big boat trailer. 
And he invited Lucas to go ride his pontoon and go for a, 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 a campfire down by the reservoir. And, of course, Lucas is all excited now. He's ready to go. He, he loved the idea of that. We just had a good time because we're out there. We want to be out and about in the community know, letting them know we love them. We have the answers from the Word of God for their eternal soul. Luke here is telling us of what is going to come. And now we shift back from that to the story at hand. The story at hand. Jesus has been teaching on these topics, and now we shift back. Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into. I'm going to have you take your Bible to a few books tonight. Um, John chapter 6, would you go there? John chapter 6. Friends, Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into. I heard one theologian say that this took Jesus by surprise. I don't call him a theologian anymore. It doesn't make any sense to me. John chapter 6. This was earlier on in Jesus' ministry. John chapter 6. I want you to look down at verse 69. The Bible says they're, they're talking to Jesus, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, verse 70, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a what? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into. See, that makes the story of Jesus, my friend, if, if it needed to be any better, that makes the story of Jesus even better. Because he knew all the suffering he was going to endure. He knew all the pain he was going to endure. And he knew it ahead of time. And he still did it. He still did it. Jesus knew exactly what he was getting into. Don't ever let someone tell you that God doesn't love you. Don't ever let your mind start to reconsider, does God really care about me? Never let your mind wander. Don't ever listen to a lie. Don't ever let yourself throw a pity party. Uh, you are someone because of Jesus Christ. Don't ever let anyone tell you you're not loved by God. Don't ever let anyone ever make you feel you are not loved by God. I think he's proven his love for us. It's about time that song goes, I gave my life to, for thee. What hast thou done for me? <laughs> I think it's our time to put in our work. It's our time to get busy for him. He's already proven it. Stop putting God on this saying, you know, God, you've got to do this in order for this. God's already done everything required for your salvation. Notice what we go on to read here. Let's look at, as we start tonight, the significance of the Passover. So we see now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. I want you to picture several years ago, before this book uh, was written by these men, before this time period, several years back, the setting is in Egypt. Joseph has come, his dad and his brothers have come to Egypt, the pharaohs died, Joseph has died, Jacob has died, it's been several hundred years, and now we come, the children of Israel are in bondage. It's Egypt. Several plagues have taken place. Moses has come to the pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, let, let God's people go. They need to go and worship him. And Pharaoh said, who is your God? Who's God? Who's the one you're serving? There's a bunch of them. Moses said, I'll show you who my God is. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. So I'll show you. He leaves, and of course the water would turn to blood, and all these different events would take place. Nine plagues have happened. It's just about evening. This isn't just a string of tough luck. This is God judging Egypt. The people are stuck here thinking they would never receive the promises of God. No doubt they'd given up on the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be, to have the promised land. But one final plague is about to take place, and this is the last one. It's the most severe of all. Israel has been exempted from these other plagues, the cattle are suffering and from uh, the, the hail. They've been exempted, but they won't be exempted from this one. That night, uh, that night the, the, the death angel would come and would kill the firstborn in every household. God aims at everyone this time, including his chosen people. By the way, his chosen people were not completely innocent. The plague, this is the idea of God is just. The Passover is a picture of mercy. So we see God's provision. The plague, we see the Passover and God's provision. God says, take a spotless lamb, 
On the 14th day of the month, the night, the death angel uh, kills the firstborn. Kill that lamb. Apply the blood to your doorpost. If you want to look back at that, that's in Exodus chapter 12. And when, when he came through, he looked for the blood that was applied to the doorpost. Therefore, the, uh, the Jews would remember that day and would celebrate that day. And that's why all these uh, possibly millions of Jews have come to Jerusalem at this time. The significance of the Passover is the perfect lamb's blood had to be shed. At this point, I don't know how many, maybe some of you would have a better idea of this, but from what I understand, Jesus had just healed Lazarus just recently. Now thousands upon thousands are following Jesus. Not necessarily for his message, but he can do more than feed them. He can do more than heal them. He can literally raise their dead. So many people are following him. So many people are thronging after him. The hype is real. Jesus has a goal and a plan in mind. They're here at the Passover because it was going to be symbolic of Jesus was the final Passover sacrifice that they would need to make. He was going to be the perfect spotless lamb whose blood was going to be shed for all the sins past, all the sins future. That's the significance of the Passover. By the way, it's a big deal. It's a big deal when he died. It's a big deal why he died. It's a big deal to satisfy the wrath of a holy God. Praise the Lord for the sacrifice of Jesus. Never get tired of singing those songs. At the cross, at the cross, where I... You know, at Calvary, years I spent in vanity. We start to think back and it points us back. Praise God for this time. The significance of the Passover. It was symbolic. It it satisfied the wrath of God. The plague was God's justice. The Passover was God's a picture of God's mercy. The lamb was a picture of God's provision. Do you see this found at the cross? The hype is still real. The hype and the excitement that's happening around. Let's pick up in verse number two. I want you to see the seriousness of the situation. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. The leaders only cared about themselves. Let me explain. Okay, let me explain. The people were not, or excuse me, the chief priests and the scribes were not worried about fearing God. They were worried about the people. Would you all do do me a favor real quick tonight? I'm going to ask a few of you to take a Bible verse, find it, and read it for me. Who will do that tonight? I've got several of them I'd like to turn to. Would you do that? Uh, Proverbs 14, 26. Who will find that? Miss Amanda, 14, 26. Proverbs 9, verse 10. Proverbs 9, 10. Brother Brian, would you do that? Uh, Proverbs, uh, excuse me, I already did that one. Psalms 111, verse 10. Miss Barb. And then one more, Job 28, 28. Job 28, 28. Colin, go ahead. Job 28, 28. Okay, when you find them, we'll do them in order here. The Old Testament is full of declarations to fear God and put God first. And what do we see? The religious leaders who should have known better, who should have known the Old Testament, but they were so caught up in themselves and what they wanted, they neglected. What God had said. Now, these are just a few. I think there's over, over several, over 50 times we could have found several verses. Let's just read a few, read them really loud here. Proverbs 14, 26. Who had that? Yes, ma'am. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. All right, good. Uh, Proverbs 9, 10. You getting a pattern here? Uh, Psalms 111, verse 10. Who had that? Who had that? Yes, ma'am. His praise endureth forever. Job 28, 28. Who had that? Right over here. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, do you understand that these men should have known better than to fear the people and what they would do? It wasn't like they were worried about, you know, necessarily the people and what they would bring back to them. What they were worried about is the people would riot and they would lose their power and their position. They would lose their their, their purpose, if you will. They would lose their their foothold over the people. They were worried about preserving their own selves. 
different motives from different religious groups, if you will, if you want to look at the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if you want to look at the, the different groups for different motives, we can. But at the end of the day, they were only concerned with con preserving their own selves. Uh, do you remember, uh, Jesus has already made a fool of them on several occasions. Jesus has cleansed, cleansed the temple twice. Jesus has done these things. He's declared them to be wrong. You remember, he's, uh, he's called them names. Exactly what they were. And you know what they're doing? They're tired of Jesus. And they want his death to be painful. They want his death to be, uh, his death to be something. So they needed a plan to get to Jesus at night so they wouldn't stir up a, a riot. Because all these people were following Jesus because Jesus has just done this great miracle, bringing them back from the dead. Now people are following Jesus, not just for his message, but now, man, this guy's got power to heal. He just healed Lazarus. Did you hear what was happening? But can I explain something to you? Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, correct? Not only did this group of people want to kill Jesus, but they wanted to kill those that were associated with his miracles. I, I, I found this very fascinating this afternoon. Go to John chapter 12. Everyone together, John chapter 12. And I was convicted today about this. How I say this might come across wrong, so I'll say it in just a moment. John chapter 12. Mary is anointing the feet of Jesus, and um, we'll look back at this chapter here in just a little bit if you want to put your finger here. But look at verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away. Went away from whom? Went away from them in their hold on them, went away from their traditions, went away from their money-making habits. The more people that came to Christ, the less attention these men got. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to not only kill Jesus, but kill those who were friends of Jesus. This is going to kind of sound wrong, but I hope I've done something enough that when people get mad at Jesus, they're mad at me. Because I'm his follower. And me and Jesus, we have a relationship. If, if, if you think Jesus is doing this wrong, I'm doing the things Jesus does. Lazarus' association just with Jesus, they, they, they want to kill him too. You understand, when people get frustrated and angry and they start to riot and this, 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 this wrath pours out of them, you know what happens with wrath? A lot of bad things. It doesn't end with one person. I think we've seen that in our country. When people start to boil over, people get hurt. Innocent people get hurt. But here in this story, they, they were going to kill Lazarus with him just because he was associated. Because people were following Jesus because of what happened to Lazarus. So they thought in their mind, well, let's kill Lazarus and say this was all just a, just a hoax. It wasn't really real. I don't know everything in their mindset, but they wanted to get rid of everyone and everything that was associated with this guy who claimed to be the Messiah. We see the significance of the Passover. We see the seriousness of this situation. They were going to lose their power over the people, their privilege, their persona. But at the end of the day, listen closely, their wallet was going to be affected. Their wallet was going to be affected. What motivated them was how people would perceive them. This had nothing to do with fearing God and following Him. It had nothing to do with fearing God. It had everything to do with me. What can I get out of this? And Jesus was in the way of their schemes. Maybe some were even, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, maybe some were very sincere. Maybe some were even very, man, they, were, they had very good purpose. Maybe they were very zealous. That doesn't mean they were right. It actually means they were wrong. It actually means they were wrong. What motivated them was how people would perceive them and what they could get from people. What motivates you? Is it, is it hey man, I wonder how people perceive me. I wonder at the end of the day what I can get out of this. That's the attitude of these individuals. That's the attitude of these individuals. It wasn't what God was doing. It wasn't what the Bible said. Many religious groups, when it boils down to it, operate out of fear of man in some essence. 
You and I ought not to be that way. We ought to not be in a clique. We ought to not be in an association. We ought to not be with a group. It ought to be, I don't care what others' opinion is. I care about what God says, and we follow Him. I'm very clear. We don't, we, here at the church here, we don't follow a college. We don't, we won't, it's not going to happen. We don't follow a college. We don't follow a group of people. We're independent for a reason. We don't follow a group of people. We want to go into what does God say and follow that. Amen? And I hope if I start going away from what God I hope you say, you know what, that he's gone down the wrong way. I can't follow that. And if you get away from what God says directly, very kindly put, just, just leave. Is that too, is that, we want to stay with what God, I don't want anybody to leave, right? Right, that's not the point. You stay with what God has to say. Notice what the Bible says, Psalms 119, verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Let's consider this, verse 3, if you would. We've got to hurry. Service to someone else. Service to someone else. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Satan has always known the plan of God and wanted to stop or interrupt the plan. The word Satan is the idea of adversary. He opposes everything God is and everything God has done and will do. Listen very closely. Satan opposes you. He opposes you, he hates you, he despises you in your walk in the Lord. He hates you. He is not seeking to help you. He will bring harm to your life. And yet so many people follow him. It's hard. I know I hate to put it with a group of people, but it's hard for young people especially. Because you see that allure and you see, you just, I've got to try it. I've just got to go experience it. And the devil loves it. Those who've walked and you've been around and you've seen what God can do and you've seen the harm that the devil brings in some of our decisions. You see how far that can lead. Satan opposes you. He hates you because he opposes God. You are loved by God and Satan wants nothing more than to destroy you. We don't have time tonight. 1 Peter 5, 8. You can look there later on. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. We see Jesus call Satan a liar. We see Jesus call Satan a deceiver. Nothing good is said about Satan. He is the opposite of God. Uh, most likely one of the most powerful angels out there, even though he has fallen. Very powerful being. And yet he hates you and wants you to fall. We are uncertain of all of his motives and his plans, but Satan used the greed of man to commit this heinous sin. I want you to look at verse 3 again with me. I want you to see Satan comes in. He wants nothing more than to destroy Judas. He doesn't want to help Judas. He uses Judas' greed to get him away from Jesus. I want you to see this being of the number of the twelve. Being of the number of the twelve. He was with them, but he was not of them. He walked and talked with Jesus, but he was not a true follower. Listen very closely to what I'm about to say. You are not saved by association. You are saved by a personal decision. You are not saved by association. You are saved by a personal decision. John tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must have a time where you have new affections when you're born into the family of God. You're born into the family of God. Let's look a little bit about him. Go back to John chapter 12. Let's look a little bit at Judas here tonight. I know we're looking in a little bit here. I'll make some application toward the end of the message. Service to someone else. John chapter 12 tells us who Judas was, really. John chapter 12, look down at verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should what? Betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he what? I thought that was one of Jesus' main staples of his ministry. Right? Obviously he came to seek and to save that which was lost, but did Jesus help the poor? Yes. His followers went with him. They saw Jesus doing this. They saw Jesus help people and be a blessing to people and care about people. Ultimately, they saw Jesus care about the souls. Did you know Judas did not care about the poor or helping them? Because he was a what? And had the bag and bear what was put 
therein. He was serving someone else, and this Satan knew how to get tempt and get Judas away from Jesus by using what was his stumbling point. Judas was greedy. Judas was greedy. Who are you really? Honestly, I want you to examine yourself in your life right now in this room, the Holy Spirit as your witness right now in that seat. Who are you really when you're not here in the pew? And I have to examine my life because I have to put on a show and I have to do all these things and I have to look right and talk right and act right. And I have to examine my life and make sure none of my life is a show. This is who I am before Jesus Christ. Who are you and I really tonight? Because there might be some people, you know, according to this statistic, one out of 12. <laughs> Obviously, we're not going to use that. But who are you really? The Holy Spirit's looking. The Holy Spirit's here right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking, and you know who you really are. What do you have tonight that you do that doesn't please God that Satan could potentially one day use to draw you away from him? in righteous living, and a righteous lifestyle. I mean in no sense that one loses salvation. That's not what I'm pointing to. But I do wonder if the oppression, if, if Satan's fiery darts that are coming after us and we're not using the shield of faith because we have something in our life, Satan used Judas greed. Would use it. It would eventually have him betray Jesus. He was one of the twelve, but he was not really one of them. His heart was not in it. You can have righteous words and a depraved heart. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about many being in heaven. It doesn't seem like there's as many that will be there who think they're going to be there. I, I, I think sometimes we just have this thought in our heads sometimes that everyone who claims to be a Christian is automatically going to be in heaven. That's not true. Many will say in that day. Many will tell God what they've done for him. Many people will have righteous words but a depraved heart. Because God's never moved in. The Holy Spirit's never come to live inside. There ought to be fruit. There ought to be something there. Judas didn't have that. He was greedy. He was greedy. He loved money more than God and God's will. My friend, can I explain to you something tonight? Don't you love anything in this world more than God? Because Satan might use that to get you in trouble. Don't love your spouse more than God. You say, oh, I thought we're supposed to love our spouse. You are, but not more than God. Don't love your children more than God. I've seen parents uh, have their kids start to grow up and they follow their kids because their kids enjoy something, they want to do something. Their children pull them away from God. Don't love your children more than God. Don't love your job more than God. Don't love your house more than God. Don't love your pursuit of some ambition that you love more than God. Because it might draw you away. Don't love money more than God. Satan used this as a stronghold to control Judas. Satan still does things today. He knows our weak points. He knows our weak points. But as we said this morning, you're no longer under his control. You have Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, living inside of you. Christ should be at the throne of our heart, and we can say no to those things. Remember that this morning? You are one of God's children, and you need to remember that. Submit to his way of thinking. Due to his greed, he couldn't get the money here in chapter 12 of the book of John. Maybe there was some bitterness and some frustration. I don't know for sure, but he couldn't get this money from selling the ointment. So just a little while later, you know what he does? He goes to the high priest. He makes a deal. Judas made the first move. Judas, by his own will, chose this route. He contacted them. They did not contact him. He was offered money now to betray Jesus, and he took the money. His motive was pure greed. He'd been with Jesus for a long time. He'd watched Jesus do great and mighty things, and yet it took just a little bit of money. It's a little bit of money to betray him. A little bit of money. Isn't it incredible how, what little things that can draw us away can turn our affections from who we used to love, Jesus. We used to love serving him. We used to love worshiping him. But we've had something that's been in our lives that's been just nagging at us and nagging at us, and it gets us away. The church gets us away from people. 
Look at verse 5, if you would. Look at verse 5, and we've got to be done here in just a few moments. The Bible says in verse 4, He went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him the money. Do you understand? The leaders were happy to kill Jesus. They found their enjoyment in the suffering of Jesus. They enjoyed the thought that they would save their jobs. They would save their allegiance of the people. They would get rid of this man who has taken over and is taking away from their revenue, is taking away from their power over the people. Because Jesus is giving people victory. Jesus is telling them he is the Messiah. And they're upset about it. Why? Because it's all about self-preservation. What made these men glad? Was it Jesus? Uh -uh. It was self-ambition. What makes you glad? What makes you glad? We took the kids uh, putt-putt golfing yesterday, and we were up there putt-putt and playing, and uh, Lucas quit half the time. <laughs> he'd hit it once, and he'd go off to another area of it. But it, it makes you glad when you get down there, and you get, you get ready, and you, you hit it, and it goes in. It happened very rarely, but it did every once in a while on occasion. And, man, it's exciting to see success, and that success made us happy. We, uh, we were playing, having a good time, and it's fun to see good things happen. How many of you have had some good things happen in your life? You ever had something good? Man, doesn't that make you happy? Man, when something just goes your way, it makes us happy. Yeah, I'm okay with that, but you know what ought to bring us true happiness? is Jesus. You know what was missing in these men's lives? Jesus the Messiah. I want you to listen very closely. It wasn't that Jesus wasn't there. Jesus has confronted them many times. He's proven them wrong many times using the scripture. He's given them all the evidence they needed. He's right there. And yet they choose to be miserable and live for themselves. You know, Jesus is right here now. He's here. He cares. He loves. But we choose our self-ambition because we love our misery more than we love Christ. We love our greed more than we love Christ. We love our drama more than we love Christ. We love, you fill in the blank, you know what I'm talking about. We love this more than we love Christ. What do we love more than Jesus today? Would you be honest tonight? Sometimes we love our attitude. We love a sour attitude. We always got it, we're just always going to have it. Sometimes we love that more than we love Christ. We love these things. Would you be honest today with God right now? I've asked you to do this a couple times, and it's on purpose. Would you sit there in your seat and just consider for a moment the Holy Spirit, your witness right now. What do you find more joy in than Jesus? What do you find more joy in than Jesus? Verse 6, he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. They were sneaky. They were sneaky. I want you to think of this. Jesus knew all of this. Jesus knew exactly who it was. According to John 13, 21, according to Mark 14, Jesus followed the will of his Father. Jesus' death was no surprise. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. Judas didn't kill Jesus. The, the, the Sanhedrin didn't kill Jesus. Jesus went to the cross because of the will of the Father. No one was going to stop him. But man's will was still at play here. Repeatedly he has said, my hour is not yet come, and yet now God has set the timetable, and everyone and everything falls into place. Yes, God knows God's, uh, the will of man way before you and I do. He already knows how we'll respond and how we'll act. Jesus lays his life down to Pilate. Four things as we're done. I'll, I'll name them very quickly. How do I trust people when some may betray me? Jesus knew one of the twelve was going to betray him. There is a high chance someone in this room or somebody in your family or one of your friends or a Christian will betray you. So how do we trust people when someone may hurt us? We do it like Jesus did. Jesus knew who it was. If you knew someone in this room was going to hurt you badly, do you think you'd feel differently about them? Probably. We shouldn't, but that's our human nature. How do, we, how do I trust people even though some have betrayed me and will betray me? Another thought I took from this, I need to make decisions based on the fear of God rather than the fear of man. The only opinion that matters in this world is God's, not man's, not man's, not man's. 
So when more things come out of, whether it's the, the, the Congress or more things come out of your family or more things come out of this and they tell you what you should and shouldn't do, the only opinion that matters at the end of the day is God's. Is God's. Greed destroys lives. There are many people living today for money. They have to have it. Can't live without it. They'll do anything to get it. Greed destroys lives. And lastly, I want you to see Jesus is perfect in the trial. So how do I trust people when some may betray me? I need to make decisions based on fear of God rather than the fear of man. Greed destroys lives, but Jesus is perfect in the trial. You know who you need more of? You know who you need a better walk with? It's the one who can help you through it all. Jesus Christ. We need more of him, not less. We need more of him, not less. Have you examined your life? What do you love more than him? What brings you joy and happiness? If everything was gone tomorrow, would Jesus still bring you happiness? Or do you love something else so much more? Friend, what do you love tonight? Judas betrayed him. Judas would lose everything. Judas is in hell today. I believe that with all my heart. He's in hell. He's burning. He'll burn forever and ever. He'll be taken out just for a brief period, and then he'll be sent back down to the lake of fire for all of eternity to live away from God. Because he loves something more than the one that was right there and who'd given him truth. More than him. More than him. What a thought tonight. What a thought tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. God, Lord, what great truths tonight. <sighs> Lord, we've got some self-examination to do. Lord, these men had self-ambition and self-preservation in mind. And yet it doesn't come up anywhere that they sought you and your word. God, you've given them your Old Testament. You promised the Messiah would come. You said this is what the Messiah would do. They had everything in front of them, but they chose to be blinded by their greed and self-ambition and self-preservation. And God, we as Christians at times, we do that, Lord, forgive us. God, there are things in our lives that truly bring us joy. And if we put a list together of what would make us so happy tomorrow, God, I feel that if we were honest, we would have to put you way down on that list. God, there would be several things that would be much higher. God, there would be TV programs that would be higher than you. There would be things on our phone that would be higher than you. God, there would be all these other things that would be bring us more happiness than our walk with you. Oh, Lord, may that not be the case in this church. May we declare tonight that we are going to find our joy, our happiness, our peace in you, and we're going to show it. Lord, I love you. I thank you so much for Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you for the friendships we can have. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen.